So today we're going to talk about trade and how buyers and sellers interact with each other uh, and how that interaction affects not only each one of them in particular but also society as a whole. Uh, the place where buyers and sellers meet, whether physically as in the old times or virtually as many times happens today, uh, is called the market. And we have seen it evolve from a very small place where people just bartered goods and services with each other to now very complex markets like the financial market, the stock market, where millions of people participate, um, connected through an intricate network of communication, transportation, and regulations. Today we'll focus exclusively on the fundamentals of what markets provide to those who uh, participate in them. And to answer this question, we have to learn some of the way of thinking that economists use, some of the models and tools that we use. And what do I mean by a model? It's a simplified representation of reality that allows us to better answer the questions that we are interested in solving. So for example, if you want, want to go to the grocery store or to the movie theater in town, you would consult a map, perhaps on your smartphone, perhaps on paper, and the map would concentrate on the streets you need to get over there. Perhaps the streets will be represented as lines. The um, direction you need to take on the smartphone may be represented by a, a virtual arrow. Uh, but if, for example, if you wanted to go to another city, then all the side streets would disappear and just the highways would be represented. So the extent to which the model connects to reality depends on the question you want to answer. That's why economists use models to understand reality. It's, it is a simplified version. It, is not, it does not contain the whole of reality, but it does allow us to capture reality in a manageable way, something that allows us to, as I said before, understand specific questions. So today we'll start by one modeling consumer behavior, and we'll do it through a concept that economists call demand. Then we will model the behavior of sellers with a concept uh, economists call supply. Then we'll put it both together in a market, and finally we'll try to get some answers with our models about the effects of trade. Um, let's start with consumer behavior. So there are many aspects of human decision making, and we're going to focus just on how consumers react to changes in prices and how much they purchase of a specific good or service. And we'll motivate this with an example. So imagine you and I are the only people in the room and that we are locked in here for the next two hours of class, me teaching and you learning, um, and you're thirsty and you would love to have some water but you forgot to bring some. Fortunately, I did bring with me three bottles of water. And perhaps for the right price, you might be able to convince me to part with one or more of them. So co concentrate just on, on one of these bottles for now. So you, you haven't drunk anything, and think for a minute, in this situation, you will not be able to get out of here for uh, two hours. How much would you be willing to pay for this water bottle? Um, think, think about it for a minute, write down your answer in your notebook, and then we'll compare it with an answer you'll give us uh, later. So imagine that, in my example, we'll have your willingness to pay for the first bottle would be $1. So you would be willing to pay one dollar for this one bottle of water. Um, fast forward a few minutes, you've drunk this uh, water bottle, but you're still some, somewhat thirsty, you're feeling better, and now you want to try to purchase the second bottle from me. How much would you be willing to pay for this second bottle? And remember the, the constraints are still in place. You still have to remain here for the rest of the two hours for the rest of the class. How much would you be willing to pay for this? Write it down, and then I'll ask you to compare those two numbers. What I would be willing to bet is that the second number, the second willingness to pay for the second water bottle was lower than for the first. So more likely than not, um, the, the first bottle was the one you wanted most. Once you have drank that uh, first water uh, bottle, then probably your willingness to pay for the second bottle might be something like 50 cents. Your numbers may differ from mine, but in general what economists observe is that the more you consume of a product, the lower you are willing to pay. Then at that point you might say, well, I've drunk enough, I have to be locked in here for uh, until the end of class, and all that water you have drunk is accumulating, so your willingness to pay for the third bottle 
might even be as low as zero. Now, what economists uh, call this phenomenon, this universal phenomenon that you see uh, for almost any person and almost any good, is the diminishing marginal utility. It's just telling you that as you consume more and more of one good, the utility f of that good for you goes down. And economists love using math. We're not going to use math today, but we also love using graphs. And we are going to try to graph these numbers in a simple graph with just price on the vertical axis and quantity on the horizontal axis. On the horizontal axis, we have our three bottles, one, two, and three. On the vertical axis, we have a dollar value like for example one dollar fifty cents and then we can plot just our example um, the data that we used was one dollar for the first bottle that would be the willingness to pay for the first bottle for the second bottle willingness to pay was just fifty cents and remember that your own numbers your preferences may may be different and for the third one you wouldn't be willing to pay anything at all, price of zero. Now, this phenomenon shows the diminishing marginal utility in, in graphical way. Now, the question is, how would you behave as a consumer uh, depending on what market price? So perhaps if I'm, I'm the one who has the water bottles, if I tell you, for example, I'm willing to part with one bottle for $2, would you be willing to purchase one or not? And you would compare your willingness to pay one dollar with the two dollar price, and you won't, you will not want to buy at that price for any price above one dollar. About about how much you value that first water bottle, your demand will be zero. So that is for any price above one dollar. If I lower the price enough to one dollar or below then you will jump and start consuming you'll buy the first bottle for me from me for any price between 50 cents and one dollar if i lower the price even further below 50 cents then your demand how much you buy of a specific product of this case water bottles you will increase to two so this is if the price is less than 50 cents. Now, this demand curve for one individual student in one specific situation looks a little funny. It still shows kind of the downward sloping uh, shape that reflects the diminishing marginal utility. But imagine that we have millions of consumers, millions and millions of water bottles in a market, and what we have is that this downward sloping demand that now looks a little jagged will become much s smoother. You will have, again, our price and quantity. It will look much more like a simple line. And what that demand represents is that for each price, the higher the price, so if you're up here, the lower the quantity that consumers will demand of that particular product. That is something that you can observe. In reality, it's not just an abstract theoretical model. It's something that economists, as scientists do. We um, have predictions, our models have predictions. We go out in reality. And we observe, we make observations about how people react to changes in prices and everything else being equal. That means with no changes in income, no changes in the number of people in the market and so forth. If the only th variable that you change is price, then in reality we do observe over and over again that the quantity demanded decreases. Now that we have our demand down, or at least part of it, let's turn our attention to the behavior of the sellers. And in the context of the same example, I would be the seller. I brought, as I mentioned before, uh, three water bottles. Let's say you want to buy one water bottle for me. I, I would offer you the one that I use as a backup since uh, I never use it. So it has very low, uh, it's, 
I am not sacrificing much by giving it to you. So economists would say we ha it has a low opportunity cost. So perhaps I would be willing to sell this first bottle to you, willingness to sell now instead of willingness to buy, for just 50 cents. Now, if you wanted to buy the second bottle from me, now, now it's causing me kind of second thoughts because I many times do end up drinking this second water bottle and if I don't get to finish the class with the first one, then um, I would feel again my dry mouth, it would cause me trouble teaching. So I'm sacrificing more by selling you a second bottle of water. And perhaps I would want at least $10 to part with this second one. So the willingness to sell on my side for the second increases to $10. And if you really wanted to push it and buy the, the third water bottle for me, then that would mean I, wouldn't, I know I wouldn't be able to teach the class. I know I might even hurt my throat. Uh, uh, so that sacrifice would be so, so high for me that perhaps I'm still willing to sell it to you, but it might require $1,000 in payment. So in an opposite way than what we had with our consumers, instead of the willingness to buy decreasing, now we have our willingness to sell increasing. The seller is sacrificing more and more each time it provides additional units to the market and we have a supply that actually shows that the higher the price, only then the producer would be willing to sell more units. Now, unlike the case with the demand curve where it is universal that we have this downward sloping shape that we have diminishing marginal utility, there's different cases for the seller, and we're going to focus today just on this case where we have an increasing opportunity cost. Just as we did with the demand curve, what we can do is try to represent this graphically for the seller. And we have price on the vertical axis and quantity on the horizontal axis. And now the shape would be upward sloping. The higher the price, the more units the seller would be willing to provide. As, as we mentioned before with the demand curve, this is a testable prediction. We can go uh, to the market, see what firms are doing in real life, and we can see if when price increases, they actually increase the number of units they're selling, everything else being equal, as, as, as I mentioned before. No other changes, no changes other than, than the price. So now we have a basic understanding of how consumers behave and how sellers behave. We can put them both together in a market and, and see what happens. And graphically, we would have, again, price and quantity. And now the two curves representing the interaction of consumers with a downward slope in demand and producers with the upward sloping supply. Now, that by itself doesn't tell you what's going to happen in the market, so we have to use a little bit of uh, thinking and a little bit of analysis to see w where we go from here. So imagine that we start with a very high price. So I'm going to do this in a different color. Um, imagine we start with a high price way up here. At that high price, suppliers, the sellers, would love to sell many units, represented by QS. But the price is so high that only a few consumers want to buy the units. And let's, let's do something more concrete so that we're not just talking abstractly. Let's say this is the market for eyeglasses in the US. So if the eyeglasses are very expensive, only a few consumers would be willing and able to buy them, but firms would want to sell more, lots and lots of them. So what happens? As the firms observe that there is excess supply, or alternatively we could say there's a surplus of eyeglasses in the market, they see eyeglasses piling up in their stores, and they would be willing to perhaps lower the price a bit even though that would cause them to produce less, it would also induce a lower price 
an increase in the number of eyeglasses purchased by consumers. So as the price goes down, the excess supply shrinks, the surplus shrinks, and this process will continue as long as the surplus exists. So as long as the firms see the eyeglasses piling up and not being sold in their entirety, they will continue lowering the price until they get to the point where the quantity demanded equals the quantity supply, and there they, they feel fine. Whatever they're producing is exactly what they're selling. On the other hand, if we have, let me start with a new graph. If you have a very low price in the market, And at that point, what you see is that people love that eyeglasses are cheap. They might buy even backup pairs, third pairs, and so forth. But the suppliers are not as happy. And for that low price, they would be willing to sell only a few pairs of eyeglasses. Now, that creates, creates a shortage in the market. That means that demand is above supply. There's excess demand. And at that point, those consumers who are not able to purchase eyeglasses at that price, they would be willing to perhaps beat up the price uh, a bit to be able to get one of those uh, eyeglasses. And as the price goes up, some of those consumers will drop out of the market or perhaps they will only buy one pair and not two or three pairs. But some producers at the same time will start producing more. So the shortage causes consumers to beat up the price that reduces the shortage because producers produce more and consumers buy less. And this process will continue again as long as there is a shortage, so it will only stop at the intersection point of demand and supply where the quantity demanded equals the quantity supplied. So what you're seeing is that even without the conscious effort of the consumers and the sellers, there will be a dynamic that will always push prices that are too high downward and prices that are too low upward and the only place where everyone will be satisfied and the system will will stop moving will be at the intersection point between demand and supply so this point is where economists predict that the market will be operating in equilibrium at PE and QE so we have a prediction that um, a specific prediction, specific number, so X number of dollars and X number of pairs of eyeglasses that economists make, and with that prediction, we can again go to real life and test, does this market actually operate at these prices and quantities? We can test our models, validate them, or falsify them as, as needed. So, very important, the concept of equilibrium in economics. Uh, also very important the fact that we can check in real life that's all something all the sciences should be able to do now I mentioned before that we wanted to study this to try to see how markets help people or not so for now this tells us a, a kind of a fundamental way in which consumers behave fundamental way in which sellers behave and the result of putting both um, assumptions together in terms of this model leads us to this equilibrium concept in a competitive market. But what happens in terms of welfare? For that we'll need to talk a little bit more about what's going on behind the scene. So let's focus on the consumers for a while. So we have our equilibrium, P and QE. And imagine I'm one of these consumers on this demand curve and I have bought my pairs of glasses at say $200. These are prescription glasses. Without these glasses, I wouldn't be able to see anything beyond probably my fingertips. So these glasses are very, very important to me. I wouldn't be able to drive. I wouldn't probably be able to teach or at least not doing the same kinds of things as, as I do now. I wouldn't be able to enjoy landscapes. So let's say that I would be willing to pay way up here $10,000 for my pair of glasses. Because without this, my income would go down. Again, I wouldn't be able to do many of the things that I enjoy every day. But I only actually pay $200 for it. So this is the price actually paid by me. So what that means is that if you take into account the difference between that willingness to pay of $10,000 
and the price I actually pay. In a sense, I'm gaining the difference of $9,800. This pair of glasses, even though they cost me in terms of price only $200, they're worth to me $10,000. The difference is mine to keep. And that is what economists co call consumer surplus. So that is what I, as an individual consumer, gain from this transaction. Without this market, I wouldn't be able to create this pair of glasses. I don't have the know-how, I don't have the skills to create this pair of glasses, so I would go around the world half-blind. Um, given this market, that makes me much, much richer, much, much happier in the real world. Now, I am not the only consumer in this market for eyeglasses in the US, so what we can do is see what happens when we have all consumers put together, we have our equilibrium price, an equilibrium quantity, and when you add up all the vertical differences, all the consumer surpluses for individual consumers for the different pairs of glasses that they are purchasing, that shows the consumer surplus for the whole market. So all consumers put together in the US enjoy that area of surplus that appears only because there's trade in eyeglasses. So that's on the consumer side. On the producer side, we have several firms that are selling eyeglasses, but let's focus first on just one of them, the one that where I actually purchased my eyeglasses. I purchased them for $200, but probably this firm only had a very a much smaller cost, lower than that price. So let's say this was my pair of glasses. I paid $200, so the firm received $200 from me. But it only cost them, say, $80. That was their cost for producing this one pair of glasses. So the difference for them this vertical distance here, this $120 in this case, that is what economists call the producer surplus. And this is just for one unit. But you can imagine that this firm and many other firms in the US not sell just one, but millions of pairs of eyeglasses. So when we put them all together in a similar way than what we had for consumers, Again, we write our equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity. And each one of these pairs of glasses will be a vertical line on this graph. When you add up all those millions of pairs, the area of that triangle above the supply curve and below the equilibrium price, that is the producer surplus for the whole market in the US. So if this market did not exist, firms would not be able to capture all those profits represented by that green triangle, the producer surplus. So we have consumers that are better off individually, such as myself. As a group, consumers are better off as well. And when you put that together with the producers, the firms are also better off. Everyone in society ends up better. And if you add up the consumer surplus, with the producer surplus in one market. Economists use that as a measure of how society has improved due to the appearance of this one market. So when you add CS plus PS, producer surplus and consumer surplus, you get society's surplus in this one market. And we have, this is just the market for eyeglasses. Imagine there are markets for computers, for clothing, for food, and so forth. So each one of them is contributing to the surplus of society. This brings us back to the gains from trade, from markets existing in our lives. Uh, look around you and look at your clothes, your food, your house, uh, your computer, your smartphone, and think about how you and your family uh, had access to them, how, how you obtained these products. Now for a minute, imagine what would happen if you yourself had to create all those products from scratch without trading with anyone. It would be physically impossible for any one of us, any one person in the world to be able to produce the stuff that we are wearing today, 
that we're using in terms of computers or smartphones, or even the food that we're eating, if you had to do everything on your own without trade, that would be impossible. We would go back to kind of caveman days. So the, the level of consumption and the level of production that we enjoy today, and even those that we enjoyed hundreds of years ago, those are only possible because of trade. Uh, so reflect on that and how trade has changed your life, perhaps in an invisible way or a less visible way. So wrapping up today's lecture, we have seen an example of how economists analyze and simplify real life so we can find, have a way of understanding reality through a manageable and useful model. So models is the first kind of big thing, big theme today. These models are not just, as we said, intellectual puzzles that we have fun doing, but they're strongly connected to the real life. And um, we have testable predictions that can lead us in better directions if we're wrong in our models. And economists can partially um, predict what consumers are doing, and actually in many cases very accurately, through demand in the case of consumers, through supply in the case of uh, sellers, and we can predict also where they will be operating, in what kind of price range or quantity range they will be operating. And finally, and perhaps this is the most important message of today, this interaction between consumers and sellers it is what perhaps one of the key factors why humanity has uh, improved so much in the several last millennia. Without trade, we would not be anywhere close where we are today. Uh, of course, there are many other details going on in the background that can complicate things. Today's lecture was uh, quite condensed and brief, so I encourage you to learn more about economics, read, uh, and perhaps um, not only about markets and welfare, but uh, the things that economists talk about. And I hope uh, you enjoy uh, a happy and rewarding learning journey.